Good day, everyone. Today is Friday, March the 26th, and thanks for uh, joining us. I'm Martin Gagel of Radius Research, and today we have on the call Trevor Peters, CEO of Willow Bio Biosciences, joining us. Willow has fascinating technology that allows it to produce ultra-pure cannabinoids through biosynthesis. Willow trades on the TSX under the ticker WLLW. Trevor, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you please walk us through your deck, and then we'll have some Q&A. Great, thanks, uh, Martin, and thanks for uh, thanks for having us. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so we'll introduce uh, Willow Biosciences uh, to you uh, today. Uh, Willow, as Martin mentioned, uh, we biosynthetically produce ingredients, uh, uh, cannabinoids. Uh, what that means is that we, uh, instead of using the original host organism, in this case, the cannabis plant, uh, we develop. Uh, a, uh, a technology or platform that is based on uh, yeast uh, such that we've engineered uh, uh, that microorganism yeast to essentially do what the plant cells do uh, and manufacture cannabinoids. Uh, the, the premise or the, uh, the, you know, the differentiator of what makes our technology special vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, plant-based cultivation is that our process really provides for a, a better supply chain management tool uh, when you think about ingredients uh, uh, for, say, 2.0 products in Canada, formulated products globally, uh, it just presents a better alternative in terms of manufacturing, whether that's purity of product, cost, uh, time to delivery. We do in 10 days what a plant does in six months. Um, the benefits are, are many uh, in terms of what our, our technology uh, provides or allows for. Uh, as well as being able to access differentiated ingredients, cannabinoids that aren't produced in abundance in the plant. Um, so in, in essence, that's the introduction to what Willow is and its business. Um, we have a lot of background doing this in previous companies. So many of us come from uh, the Bay Area Synbio uh, world, uh, could access and tracks on other companies. Um, strong background in being able to deliver both pharmaceutical ingredients as well as food uh, ingredients. So we've worked with the largest, um, you know, some of the world's largest pharma companies, some of the world's largest food ingredient uh, providers. Um, so we really have a strong basis in terms of being able to tackle this, um, this new product category, cannabinoids, uh, given that we're very well capitalized also. Uh, this is, uh, although there's a lot of R&D, there's a lot of money that goes into that. Uh, and we'll get into what that means uh, here in a few slides. Um, and we've got some great partnerships. Again, we have a lot of background doing this, uh, so we understand uh, the full chain of what needs to be accomplished uh, from the lab bench all the way to the 100,000 liter fermenter unit to be able to deliver products. Um, so maybe I'll just flip ahead here and we'll actually talk a bit more detail about what biosynthesis means or what it is. Uh, essentially, uh, as you see in the, uh, my top left anyway, the cannabis plant um, we go to the host organism, cannabis, the plant, uh, understand how it makes cannabinoids. Uh, we harvest or take the knowledge of that genetic information, the metabolic pathway um, by which cannabinoids are produced, and we replicate that in the yeast cell. Um, the yeast cell is uh, a very beautiful organism, um, single cell organism that has the same, uh, many of the same characteristics as what plant cells or human cells have. Uh, and so it provides a very nice uh, framework or infrastructure uh, to be able to manipulate it uh, such that it will produce uh, cannabinoids. And so we've done that today. Um, that's our, uh, on the right, you see there cannabigerol, CBG, the first product that we're planning on uh, bringing to market. So we've engineered a yeast cell to make uh, CBG uh, at commercial uh, levels um, and as well, uh, I mentioned earlier, um, one of the other great things about this platform uh, is that we aren't really limited to just one cannabinoid whatsoever. We can make minor adjustments, tweaks, if you will, to the yeast cell uh, such that other cannabinoids can be produced as well um, to the same abundance and purity levels as what we're seeing in, in cannabigerol. Uh, and we'll talk to that uh, more in a bit. It's important for you to understand this is not the, the concept of biosynthetically producing ingredients is not necessarily new. It's been around for some time. Um, Many of the products though that are out there are what I would characterize as simple, uh, i.e. the pathway to manufacture is, is much easier in terms of how to engineer that yeast cell. Uh, what we're doing today is more complex um, and a lot of the 
advances we've seen in gene editing technology like CRISPR-Cas9 and the like um, have evolved to the point where uh, we can use those technologies more readily uh, to solve for more complex pathways uh, like the, the cannabinoid pathway in the cannabis plant. Um, so in the bottom left, you can see some interesting examples, many of which are probably familiar to you, vanilla and stevia. Uh, the heme protein is another one that uh, has recently gotten a lot of notoriety. Um, these are all products that are made using biosynthetic methods and fermentation uh, in particular. The one thing I'll say before leaving this slide is I, I mentioned earlier the some of the supply chain benefits or characteristics. If you look at that tank on the right hand side, our productivity uh, is limited by two things. The first is uh, how efficient the yeast cell is that we engineer. Um, and the second thing is the size of the tanks that we ultimately want to use. Um, and that's really you know important to understand. I mean, in the in the sizes of tanks that we're envisioning, uh, at least early on, we'll be able to make you know half a ton or a ton of product uh, based on uh, the um, based on the size of the tanks and the um, and the efficiency of the yeast cell that we have uh, today. So it it really does allow for uh, a very scalable process in terms of being able to take. Uh, production to much higher levels in very short periods of time, uh, just based on uh, just based on the size of the tank that we we access. Um, so Trevor, those, yes, sir. Uh, did, did can you reiterate, like on one of the larger tanks, how much like CBD or cannabinoid could you produce out of one of those? Presumably, when you get up to scale, at yeah, that? yeah. Uh, the uh, you know just a simple example, um, you know, a, a fifty thousand liter tank. You know, we could produce probably something between five and 10 tons of product per year. Per and year, okay, not, not per batch, per year, okay. Per year, yeah, per year. Per batch, we typically run about 40 batches uh, per annum. Um, yeah, so it, it gives you a sense of just how, how again, the, the just-in-time inventory management, if we're running 40 batches a year, it makes it easier to supply customers. But on a per annum basis, yeah, you know, 50,000 liters, depending on, uh, the cannabinoid and its progress, uh, it, it could any, be anywhere between five and 10 tons of productivity. And I guess if you're running 40 batches a year, that's what roughly one every eight, nine, 10 days or so. If one batch would go bad, you, you've got another one coming up. It's not like a six month crop that you've got to rotate through. You've got pretty quick Cycle. Yeah, and and that does happen, Martin. So if, if we ever did lose a batch, um, it's it's a fairly straightforward exercise to you know sterilize these tanks really the fermentation time for us is about five days uh and then we we transfer over into what we call our dsp or downstream process and that's about another five days so it's about 10 days all in for the total process uh but if a batch were to go bad say in the tank um you know it, it's fairly easy just to um you know dump the product dump the broth um, and then sterilize the tank, which would be done anyway, um, and then restart the uh, the process. All right. Um, one of the, I think, the more important characteristics about fermentation of cannabinoids is the environmental impact. Um, this is definitely something, uh, I, I read a report the other day that uh, Colorado cannabis cultivation uh, CO2 emissions have now exceeded the mining of coal uh, CO2 emissions in the state of Colorado. I think this is something people really need to appreciate is that the amount of, whether it's power or water uh, that are being drawn on uh, to produce uh, uh, cannabinoids essentially um, is, is substantial. Uh, and this is again, an area where obviously this results in lower cost for us because we're using less energy inputs, et cetera. Uh, but just the footprint, when you think of either indoor cultivation or even outdoor, uh, cultivation. There is a tremendous amount of water usage, CO2 produced, um, none of which are really present in any of our processes. So it is a very important facet of what we do. And the last thing I'll say on this slide is uh, our, especially our larger potential customers, uh, take this slide very seriously. Um, the concept of environmental management is very, um, not just topical, but is now really embedded in their organizations as far as uh, you know, KPIs for the organization. And so this is something that really matters to them in terms of their overall ESG footprint um, and is is not to be taken lightly when they look at 
getting into the space of, of, of cannabis. Um, so a bit of background on where we're at today. So I mentioned earlier, we're producing, uh, you know, cannabigerol, um, you know, past the lab bench. Uh, so this is a, a, a pilot or a series of pilots, I should say, because we've run multiple. Uh, but this is a picture of our first uh, uh, from last uh, September uh, last year. You can see the bottom right. That's what cannabigerol looks like at a 99.9% .9 purity level. Uh, comes in a dry powdery format. Uh, in the left, you see a 500 liter uh, sartorius fermentation tank. That's the pilot run that we did. Um, and this is important because, uh, you know, whilst a lot of people talk about doing this, uh, there are a number of steps for this ultimately to become commercial. It's not simply an exercise of discovering some things at the lab bench, filing a few patents, and then off you go. Um, that's really only about 10 to 20% of the workload. Um, the uh, going from the, the lab to ultimately the 500 liter pilot, which is the last step before commercialization, uh, is a very involved process, something that we've uh, done multiple times now uh, since this September run uh, from which these pictures came from. Um, and our partner, Albany Molecular Research, uh, AMRI um, in upstate New York, one of the world's more sophisticated manufact uh, fermentation manufacturing organizations. Uh, they've been great to work with, very familiar with cannabinoids. Um, they make uh, chemically synthesized cannabinoids today for the pharmaceutical market. Um, so we've, uh, we've found a, and have a great partner with them uh, in doing what we've done. Bottom line is, uh, you know, we're, we're successfully uh, through the pilot phase. Um, uh, we're still using it to do uh, some optimization work, uh, but we are going to be entering the large tanks here shortly. Uh, running a 10,000 uh, liter run uh, in the very near, very near future, um, which ultimately means we've, you know, we've semi-graduated from uh, uh, from this process pilot and going into commercialization. So very important step and something we've done. Trevor, sorry to interrupt. When you, your partner who, who runs the fermentation tanks, you said they're already producing uh, synthetic cannabinoids. How is what they're doing different than what you're doing? Yeah, um, yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that, Martin. Uh, so you can arrive at cannabinoids essentially three ways, biosynthesis, uh, cultivation, plant cultivation, or uh, organic chemistry. Uh, and today the, the uh, cannabinoids, THC and CBD um, uh, that are uh, used in APIs, uh, Epidiolex is made through plant cultivation, uh, but it's the only one. Other APIs, uh, for say, dronabinol, marinol, other uh, pharma products are all made using chemistry. Uh, AMRI is one of the suppliers of uh, THC uh, for, for instance, for the, for the dronabinol, marinol uh, market. The challenge there on the chemistry side uh, is that the chemistry is very expensive. Uh, so the starting materials alone are in the thousands of dollars uh, to, to derive or manufacture those products. Uh, and it's also a very difficult process to scale. Uh, so while AMRI might produce a few kilograms a year of product using chemical synthesis, um, it's not something that they could readily scale to hundreds or even thousands of kilograms, uh, which is where biosynthesis really obviously fits in quite, quite nicely. So does that Correct. answer your question, Martin? Yep, thanks. No problem. Uh, so maybe a little background on cannabigerol. Um, you know, why are we pursuing this molecule? What are its, um, you know, bioactive uh, benefits, if you will, health and wellness? Uh, cannabigerol, first off, uh, you can see on the on the graphic there, uh, is often termed the mother of cannabinoids. So CBGA, which you see on the chart, uh, ultimately is converted by the plant uh, into uh, several other cannabinoids, which you can see uh, some of which are on that uh, graphic there. Uh, THC, CBD, and CBC, just the more commonly known ones. Uh, so cannabigerol is, is great from the perspective of, as we were building the pathway, it was really the foundation for us, uh, if we wanted to ultimately go to other cannabinoids as well. Um, and so CBG was our first target for primarily for that reason, uh, but also uh, CBG in its own right is a fantastic cannabinoid. There's a lot of really interesting research out there uh, early stage, but interesting research around what cannabigerol is in terms of how it interacts with our endocannabinoid system. Uh, we're actually going to be publishing some of our own research. Uh, we've we've done some 
uh, small C clinical data uh, generation uh, with respect to CBG as a topical ingredient. Um, in the, over the next several months, you'll see information from us with regard to that um, and really establishing what those bioactive properties are. Uh, and so we're gonna be able to publish that and have that information. Uh, it is very relevant when you think of CBG as uh, you know, an ingredient, especially uh, on the topical space, uh, being able to provide um, you know, the, the actual uh, health and wellness benefits for the end consumer is gonna be important. Uh, as opposed to just you know dumping plant-based material into whatever uh, product format happens to sell. Uh, so we're actually going to have some good data uh, to go behind our ingredient. As well, we're going to have safety uh, data. And this is something else that I we're starting to see a lot more of uh, come down the pipe, especially in the US and Europe, um, is that the regulators are requiring things like grass, generally regarded as safe, uh, or uh, on the topical uh, side to make sure that the the safety data have been generated that such that uh, everyone knows that it's it's a safe ingredient uh, for for topical applications and so we're endeavoring to do both of those in fact we're most of the way through the topical side today uh, and we've kicked off grass work we'll have that done by the end of the year uh, such that we're going to have cannabinoids that meet those two criteria for either the U.S. or European uh, markets. Trevor sorry I, I, maybe a good I, when you like you, you're obviously THC CBD in that and a marijuana plant you smoke a joint or whatever it's not just that there is a whole myriad of other chemicals in there terpenes and things yep. like that do you produce any of that stuff and it, it, I don't know if you can talk about the scientific research has there been done a lot of research on some of the effects either good or bad how much they're associated with the actual cannabinoid molecule versus all those other ones that typically come with it in a, when it's grown in a plant? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, yes, the, we, there is uh, lots of interesting data out there. Um, um, most of it's very, I would say, discombobulated though. Um, the, 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 the concept of, uh, you know, what you may be referring to is the entourage effect, um, really poorly understood. And, and that's because when you've got you know, say 30 or 40 different active ingredients that one is ingesting, it's hard to isolate which one is actually having the, the greatest impact. Um, so in our process, maybe I'll just start with your question. In our process, we only produce a single cannabinoid. Uh, terpenoids, terpenes are made using biosynthesis. Um, there's another company in the Bay Area called Sistina, uh, which uh, actually makes uh, terpenes in biosynthesis. They're, they're uh, abundantly available, I would say. Um, and so our, our real target here, Martin, is to produce the cannabinoid in its highest purity form uh, and then let the formulator on the other side decide what mix they ultimately want to have. Uh, and so you mentioned the plant side. Today, we're really, all we get is what the plant gives us. And what's unfortunate about that is, first of all, there's a lot of variety. Uh, so if one were to say smoke a joint, like you mentioned, um, there's, uh, there's going to be a lot of variation between plants. There's gonna be a lot of variation between crops in terms of what that chemical admixture looks like. And we want to eliminate that such that the end consumer, the, the user has a consistent experience every time, at least for those who want that. Some people like the variety, but there are a lot of people who really just want to have the same experience once they, once they find a good one. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to target is that market. Um, you know, a formulator can buy terpenoids off the shelf um, and, uh, and, you know, come up with the, the, the formulation that they feel has the best olfactory experience, taste experience, and ultimately the the overall health and wellness uh, experience as well. So hopefully that answers your question, Martin. Yep, thanks. Cheers. Um, so I've, I've alluded to this earlier, and uh, but I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more now. So one of the other great things about our platform is we can produce a number of cannabinoids. So THC and CBD are obviously the, the most well-known, uh, but there are many other cannabinoids within the plant, over a hundred. Um, some of which we think are going to have uh, at least health and wellness aspects and potentially pharmaceutical applications. 
uh, associated with them. Um, you know, cannabigerol, for instance, uh, has been mentioned in the literature as having uh, in vitro some effects on uh, positive effects on uh, glioma, cancer. Um, and so we think there's a lot of potential with respect to other cannabinoids beyond THC and CBD. Um, and this is where our platform really shines uh, is in the fact that many of these cannabinoids beyond THC and CBD will never be produced, uh, at least not in the next you know, near medium term in any abundance. Uh, whereas we're, uh, as I said earlier, with a matter of a bit of tinkering, we're already able to make THC, for instance, in abundance. Uh, through our process, which ultimately will lead to THCV, um, which is the varin form uh, of THC, uh, which has a lot of interesting properties uh, that there is some published literature around appetite suppressing, metabolite, metabolism boosting uh, health and wellness properties. So it really is uh, starting to evolve as we thought it would ultimately is that our yeast platform will en enable us to produce a multitude of high value cannabinoids that will otherwise be inaccessible uh, to, to the general population. So it's working out quite nicely. And you can see some of the other interesting effects here from some of these other cannabinoids. And we're really the only way to cost effectively bring these products to market today. Chemistry and uh, the plants uh, are just too challenging to, uh, to get there. Um, pharmaceutical applications, uh, you know, many people are familiar with GW and Epidiolex, the great work that GW did to bring Epidiolex to market uh, for treating uh, refractory epilepsy in kids. It's great uh, what they've done. And it's awesome to see that a cannabinoid like CBD uh, has the positive effects that it does without any modifications really done to it at all. Um, and so this is an area, again, where we have a lot of comfort working in uh, the pharmaceutical space. We've, we've developed active pharmaceutical ingredients or APIs for pharma before in past lives. Um, but really the, uh, the number I always like to point to on this slide is the fact that you can see in that second bullet there, the amount of cannabidiol CBD that's gonna be required just for uh, the, the small population uh, of refractory epileptic kids in the US alone uh, equates to some 10 tons of demand. Uh, the number is more than triple that if you look at uh, the overall refractory epileptic population in the US. So you could be looking at something like 30 to 40 tons of CBD needed uh, to, treat, uh, to treat those populations. So it's an area of focus for us, uh, being able to derive cannabinoids for either clinical trial or ultimately um, full-scale drug manufacturing. This is something we're well suited. Uh, pardon me to uh, to ultimately do uh, for the for the pharmaceutical market. What we produce today, for instance, for cannabigerol is already at a greater purity than what uh, Epidiolex is uh, for for GW. So very attractive way to manufacture, not just low cost, but also better purity than what uh, can be achieved in the plant. So just to slip uh, slide back to the prior Epidiolex, and you were saying it previously that that is plant derived. They take yep. the plant and then they extract it and filter it and do whatever to get yep. that. That's correct. And and they're trying to get as pure of uh, CBD as possible within that. Yep. As a let's say as you a potential competing supplier of let's say to uh, Jazz Pharmaceutical, I guess now. Could they like? Could you sell to to Jazz and say, "Hey, use our CBD instead of what you're using right now," or would that cause a whole new phase of trials to go no. through process and, yeah. and that? Yeah. So the um, to switch out manufacturing once an API has been approved by the FDA, it's about a six month process, maybe twelve at the outside. Uh, but it it is uh, the identical molecule. It's really the FDA just needs to vet the new manufacturing process. Um, so absolutely, we could end up producing CBD for jazz. Ultimately, uh, all we'd have to do is run through a recertification of the manufacturing with the FDA um, or in the in Europe, uh, the EMA, the European Medical Association. So that's uh, that's as as I don't want to uh, um, sort of downplay the complexity of that, but it's something that gets done all the time in the pharmaceutical manufacturing world. Uh, it just takes a bit of time, but no need for new clinical trials or any anything like that. All right. 
Uh, consumer products, though, is where we plan to focus first. Um, you know, the pharma market is still developing, will take some time, uh, but we think there's a tremendous amount of potential there, and we're already supporting some early stage clinical work. Um, the growth from consumer products is really what's most exciting for us today, near term. Um, being able to provide uh, these highly pure ingredients for uh, beverages or, or even simple products um, that we're seeing, edibles, um, as well as other uh, formats like topicals and things like that. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of demand for uh, a highly pure ingredient. Uh, and the, the, the reasons for that are many. Uh, shelf life stability being one, um, that's, a, that's a big one, especially when you consider like THC or CBD um, as a highly regulated product, say in the Canadian market. So having variability there. Uh, leads to product recalls and the like. And those are challenging things, obviously, for companies. Uh, also being able to just do formula work in a complex food and beverage matrix uh, with a variety of ingredients. It's a lot easier when you don't have contaminants. Uh, and more importantly, a, uh, a variety of contaminants. Uh, so one of the challenges that we see uh, from our potential customers or for them today is that they get a batch of uh, of say THC based product, which is at 85% purity with a contaminant profile that looks significantly different than the contaminant profile that came from the previous batch. Uh, and so they're having to change their formulation work on the fly, uh, which presents all sorts of supply chain management issues, formulation issues. Uh, and this is an area where when you think about, you know, being working in a highly regulated environment, you wanna get it right the first time. And then also being able to move beyond borders uh, say from Canada to the United States or or to Europe, um, knowing that there is a supply chain uh, that that exists to provide those ingredients is very important to to these customers, um, and and many of them are already used to getting ingredients that are made using biosynthetic processes. Uh, you know, many of the sugars that are out there. Uh, I mentioned the terpenes earlier. Many of those products that are already in our day to day lives. Uh, are already being made using biosynthetic processes. So this is something where, you know, large XYZ beverage co or generally consumer packaged goods company, they understand this uh, process very well. And so they're very amenable uh, to, first of all, vetting our technology, uh, understanding the processes, they've seen them before, uh, and then appreciating the benefits for for their business in terms of just being able to have uh, supply on the shelves, a uh, very important uh, factor uh, for this. Um, just flipping ahead, going back to uh, some operations. So uh, where we are today, uh, you can see sort of middle of your screen, large scale 10,000 liters. That's basically where we are today, um, where we've come from. Uh, you know, we've started to develop other cannabinoids. Uh, we mentioned uh, last year that we uh, uh, or I guess earlier this year, uh, that we were also going to be working on tetrahydrocannabinol, C THC. Um, THC is a great product uh, in Canada. There's a very uh, established market for it here. Uh, and frankly, uh, what we're seeing is that the, the, the early stage, you know, plant cultivation and extraction, uh, whilst that worked for a time, you know, to get products off the, uh, you know, off the assembly line into the shelves, um, that's really a process that's that's limited, uh, and there there needs to be better supply chain management around that. Uh, you know, cultivation ultimately is is uh, nefariously difficult. Uh, it's farming, um, and so faces all of those challenges. And just being able to provide a more steady supply of highly pure ingredients, uh, even for something as as uh, abundant as THC. Uh, is getting us a lot of traction in the Canadian market and obviously something we can roll out globally uh, if and when we see legalization across other jurisdictions outside of Canada. Uh, but cannabigerol, where we're at today, so starting to produce that in 10,000 liter imminently. Uh, and then ultimately, what you see on the left-hand side is what we call our tighter levels. I mentioned the efficiency of the yeast cell uh, earlier. Uh, tighter is really the best measure of that. So how efficient is our yeast cell? Importantly, uh, as our titer level, as the efficiency level of the yeast cell goes up, uh, our uh, cost of goods sold goes down uh, proportionately. Um, and that's really a function of when we 
uh, when we run a batch, we essentially rent the tank and you know provide ingredients, nutrients for the yeast. There's a cost associated with that. And so the more abundant uh, the product, the product is, the productivity of the yeast cell is in the tank, uh, our costs go down just based on utilizing that tank for a batch run. Um, so you know, important to see that curve keep going up. Uh, and then on the right, uh, uh, you can see some more of the other bullets that are there. Um, we haven't decided, uh, we haven't decisively decided yet that uh, CBGB, THCV, CBDV are going to be our next cannabinoids, uh, but they're definitely ready to go. Um, so they've all passed proof of concept at the bench. Um, and we'll just assess, you know, the market demand uh, for which of those cannabinoids we ultimately want to bring uh, to market. There are other cannabinoids that aren't even on this uh, slide uh, that are also ready that may um, ultimately be the ones that we choose to commercialize and, uh, and bring forward. But the point being is that, you know, as we progress up here, uh, we're going to have uh, a variety of, of ingredients to provide to the market. This is, al this is also something that I would say, you know, going back to that previous slide, talking about the consumer markets. This is also something that has a lot of appeal to, uh, you know, large consumer goods companies in that we're sort of a one-stop shop uh, in terms of being able to help them with their existing product lines and also launching new product lines based on uh, uh, new cannabinoids. Um, it's a very, uh, it just provides them with a lot of comfort that uh, we, they can come to us and we'll deliver. With them, um, sorry, if we can stake yep. on this slide here for a second. So it looks like you're going into like scale up development on, on CB or on CBG, you're going to be commercially producing your, your planning or expecting by the end of this year and fourth quarter. Is that the plan? We'll, yeah, we're going to start commercial production uh, much sooner than that. Um, so we'll be start, like I said, we'll be starting that imminently, uh, our first run. So once we're in a 10,000 liter tank, uh, Martin, that's really commercial scale. So 500 liters is nice. Uh, as a pilot, you produce a few hundred grams from that. That's great for sampling for customers and and doing some uh, you know experimental design to optimize the process. Uh, but once we're in the ten thousand liter tank, that's really uh, that's you know we're starting to make commercial batches at that point. And so the balance of this year um, will be you know we've gone from five hundred liter now to ten thousand liter. Um, we are going to be producing product for sale. Um, for you know, Q, Q2, Q3, Q4 of this year. Um, the, uh, when we say optimized commercial process, really that means that we've worked all the bugs out of the 10,000 liter tank. Um, we know we're gonna have um, you know, unexpected results uh, that we can optimize and, and uh, work to fix and things like that. So when we say optimized commercial process, that just means by the end of this year, we'll have worked out if not all, most of the bugs that are associated with uh, manufacturing at, at scale. And uh, you're an ingredients company, right? You're not going to be selling little vials of CBD or THC at your my local cannabis shop or anything like that, are you? Yeah, not not likely. Not not really with that type of um, you know, call it the Willow brand. There's a chance that we'll be co-manufacturing though with partners. Um, so, uh, ultimately bringing ingredients to market in some type of finished format, um, is something that we can do. Uh, and so, you know, we might get a lot closer to the store shelf, uh, than just being, you know, than just providing a, you know, a pure ingredient. Um, and I think there are certain areas, Martin, where we may endeavor to actually look a, a little further downstream. Um, there are some areas that I think are not well served today. Uh, by existing uh, cannabis companies, uh, not well served at all. Uh, and we are, you know, we have the sophistication, we have the, uh, you know, the safety and the activity data around our ingredients, uh, such that we may want to be the ones to ultimately bring that uh, to market. Um, very likely, we'll do that in partnership with somebody else, whether it's distribution or branding. Uh, but that is something that we are very capable of doing and getting a little further beyond just the bulk ingredient supply. So could it end up at a point where like back in the old days, a Diet Coke or was what NutraSweet, sweetened with NutraSweet where, or Intel inside on computers where it could be, here's whatever Diet Coke or whatever with Willow CBD or something in it. So you kind of a sub-brand within a 
right. sort of branding the ingredient, that sort of thing? Yeah, the Intel inside is a good example, uh, Martin. You know, that's, that is definitely something that um, uh, we would look to do, whether it's, you know, food, beverage, topical, uh, cosmetic type formats, uh, regardless of what, you know, whether we're actually doing the co-packing or co-manufacturing, that's definitely going to be something that you'll see from us, uh, you know, as our products are making it uh, onto the shelves, you know, whether it's another brand, um, uh, but our, you know, as you said, sub-branding uh, alongside that, absolutely. And at this point, is there risk that, like, are we positive that you can produce this at scale? You can sort of save what you can do, or, or like, how much technology risk is there yep. still in this? Yeah, no, the, uh, you know, the pilots, uh, I, we've run about half a dozen pilots uh, since we announced that first one in September. Um, you know, we've really, we've really worked out a lot of the bugs. Uh, and this is, you know, we're following normal course here for uh, fermentation scale up. Um, we've worked out a lot of the, the kinks uh, on the pilot side. Uh, there's still work to be done. Um, and I already mentioned to you that, you, you know, that going from large scale 10,000 liter bullet to the optimized commercial process. I mean, there's gonna be more stuff to work out as well. But what I can say is that we've got a good process working at Pilot and we've run it a few times now. You know, we understand where the kinks are. We've worked them out uh, such that we're ready to go into the, the larger environment. Um, so I think the technical risk now really, uh, you know, really lies between that bullet, you know, 10,000 liters going up to that optimized commercial process uh, bullet. Um, and there are a variety of ways that, you know, we know we're going to get there. Uh, we've got a lot in the queue in terms of uh, being able to make that, you know, that next jump uh, to that next process uh, or that next big bullet there. So the, the technical risk, you know, first of all, we've got to get into the 10,000 liter tank and run that. Um, nothing's without risk, but um, again, we piloted six times, so uh, we feel pretty comfortable that the 10,000 liter run will go well. Um, and then for the rest of the year, we'll just be optimizing that process, getting to the end of the year and having something that we can really run, you know, 30 to 40 batches next year and feel very confident that each of those batches uh, is going to be highly productive. All right. Um, so I'll just carry on, um, you know, a bit, a bit of a shout out to the management team. Uh, you know, they've done an amazing job. I mean, we've basically gotten to commercial readiness in less than two years. We went public April 12, 2019, uh, and in just less than two years, we're starting to produce, you know, our first, uh, our first cannabinoid uh, at a commercial level. Um, so it's a really a testament to how good uh, our technical team is. They're, they're incredible uh, people, uh, extremely hardworking and very intelligent, obviously. Uh, we have, uh, I forget exactly how many PhD level scientists we have, but it would be north of 20. Um, and, and just very strong as well industrially. Um, most, if not all, uh, are, uh, you know, three to five years removed from academia, uh, i.e. they've, you know, they've, they've had their souls crushed in industry and they know They've got to perform and uh, and get and get uh, something done, and it's across a variety of disciplines as well. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, just getting uh, a, a yeast strain ready is 20% of the work, and then, you know, getting into the commercial assets, you need fermentation engineers. Uh, there's a variety of disciplines uh, resident within Willow, uh, and they all have a very particular focus, and they all have a lot of experience in their particular area of focus. That's what's allowed us to go from the bench into the big tank so quickly, uh, is is just that skill set, uh, and we've done it before. Um, and on the business side, I think it's always important for people to understand, you know, this is not a science project. This is a commercial operation, um, and whether it's myself, this is my seventh startup, uh, Martin, as we were uh, talking about before the call started. Um, you know, I've got a lot of experience doing this, taking things. Uh, from the early private stage through the public and ultimately to a successful exit to a larger entity, um, whether that's myself, our CFO, uh, Travis, or our board of directors, we all have a lot of experience um, doing exactly what it is that we're, we're doing uh, today in terms of uh, you know, commercial readiness and uh, raising capital, stewarding shareholder uh, uh, money. Um, so it's, it's, a, um, 
ultimately a good, uh, good overall mosaic in terms of building a company for success. Um, I might just run through this quick. The our financial position. I mentioned this at the outset. You know, we're we're fairly strong, uh, well capitalized. Um, you know, significantly, I think for uh, investors today. You know, this is a company that was. IPO two years ago, uh, raised ultimately $37 million uh, in Canadian uh, in proceeds from that. Um, managed to weather COVID. Uh, you know, last year was was tough on everyone. Um, we actually did very well uh, through the year. We were lucky in many ways, um, but uh, you know, we're also very accustomed to uh, you know working in labs. Uh, you know, wearing PPE and things like that is not new territory for us. Uh, so we were, you know, we were very fortunate in terms of the progress that we were able to make. Uh, still challenges, of course, but we we uh, we weathered that storm, and we're still weathering it. Everybody is, um, but significantly. Uh, you know, I think the market really started to recognize, especially some bigger institutions, uh, what we were doing. Uh, and so recently we were able to uh, raise via bought deal financing with Bank of Montreal and Aid Capital, Canaccord, um, just under $30 million in a bought deal financing uh, at uh, nearly double the price at which we IPO'd at. Um, and so we're in a very good financial position, just under 50 million of cash on the balance sheet today, uh, with a lot of the you know, risk behind us, a lot of the heavy lifting uh, behind us today. Uh, so we're, you know, we're in a, we're in a very good, uh, very good financial position. So 123 million basic shares outstanding, just under 160 million fully diluted. Options warrants, performance warrants, uh, those are all uh, with management. Um, the options, very standard, uh, and you can see the strikes, et cetera, below. Uh, there, buck uh, twenty-seven average for the options, the warrants and performance warrants. Uh, those are all uh, with management, um, in the sense that we, on our IPO event, uh, put in uh, something I want to say around fifteen to twenty million dollars, including our major shareholder to Atara, um, who sit on the board as well. Um, so that's who the warrants are to. Um, so it's not as though those warrants are, you know, an overhang in any way. They're to insiders, uh, and we have some pretty strict vesting uh, criteria that we have to meet. Uh, in fact, the last vesting hurdle that we have, you can see there, three dollars and fifty cents uh, per share uh, to uh, to receive those uh, the, the last tranche of the warrants. Um, so it's not like we've even earned those warrants yet. Um, we've got a you know a bit of work to do before we get there, but we're aligned with shareholders in the sense that. As a management team, without Tuatara, we've already put in about eight million dollars of our own capital, um, and then with Tuatara, you can add on another twenty or so million uh, to that as well. So insiders have a big stake in this, and those warrants are just a reflection of how we've aligned ourselves with shareholders. You, you've um, mentioned Tuatara. Who and what is that? The yeah. BC Group, or, or what is it? No, yeah, the Tuatara is a. Um, they've been around since 2014. Um, they're probably one of the earliest private equity groups uh, to really participate in the cannabis space. Uh, very sophisticated team, uh, ex-JP Morgan uh, investment bankers, um, and a lot of experience in cannabis. Uh, so we were their first investment in Fund 2, uh, which was, I think, on the order of 300 to $400 million was, it, was their Fund 2. Uh, total size, um, and they've had a lot of success uh, in terms of deploying that capital. We were one of their first investments. Uh, Al Foreman, who is their CIO, sits on our board. Um, just a, a great group of very cannabis savvy investors who uh, have a very strong view uh, on technology as it relates to uh, cannabis production. Um, you know, they're they're very sophisticated. They see the evolution of the cannabis market beyond the plant, uh, ultimately big consumer companies getting into the space uh, and really SynBio or biosynthesis uh, is, the, is the bet that they've made uh, in terms of you know, getting, into, uh, uh, getting into that ingredient supply chain. Um, and they've got a very, very strong view on that. All right. Uh, and I'll just wrap up. Um, you know, the uh, some of these numbers on here, of course, come from analysts like Raymond James, the 
uh, the PV of the SynBio market for cannabinoids, $40 billion in size. Uh, obviously, that's evolving uh, into those numbers, uh, ultimately. Um, you know, one of the other great things about our platform is we really are multi-jurisdictional. Uh, I know there's been a real talk, uh, a lot of talk lately about moving into the U.S. Uh, for the Canadian LPs. For us, it's really just about establishing a manufacturing presence. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Europe is where we're starting to manufacture first. Uh, and we're starting to do that, obviously, quite quickly. Uh, the U.S. would be no different in that if we see relaxation in the U.S. of uh, the, the legalization uh, around cannabis, uh, we can very quickly ramp up production in the U.S. We have a lot of ties uh, into U.S. customers who, frankly, we're working with uh, in the Canadian landscape today who'd be very interested in the U.S. Uh, landscape. That's one of the reasons why they're talking to us. And so for us to roll out in multiple jurisdictions, again, it's not like we have to plant a new crop somewhere or buy a new field. Uh, it's really about just accessing fermentation tanks uh, which, from a third-party perspective, are fairly readily available, uh, at least in the U.S. and uh, and the European markets. Um, you know, we've started to produce CBG today. Importantly, there's no THC, even at very low limits of uh, detection. Um, so it, it it does have that high purity side to it, which is important for regulators in Asian markets, European markets, U.S. markets, definitely. Um, and so we really have a, a developed a great process and a great ingredient uh, for which there is very little competition today. Um, and then the other cannabinoids that we're developing, I think that's one of the other exciting things is that there are not just multiple formats that we're targeting in terms of finished product with a single cannabinoid, but there are, um, you know, sort of this vector multiplication effect of, uh, you know, we've got a variety of cannabinoids for a variety of finished products. And so that really opens up the customer base for us. You know, we go from several uh, to dozens, ultimately, uh, in terms of uh, customers who want to buy ingredients for us for, uh, you know, whatever finished products they ultimately want to uh, deliver to their customers. So this is an exciting year for us. We're starting commercial production shortly, um, and it will be a matter of, uh, you know, establishing the consumer pipeline, the customer pipeline this year, and really setting ourselves up for next year where, once we're in continuous manufacturing, we can start to produce hundreds of kilograms, uh, ultimately thousands of kilograms of product uh, for for those customers. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there, Martin. All, all right. Um, I, 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 I'm going to ask a bit of a sloppy, big uh, question here. There's a, a from the audience here. Okay. Someone asking about um, synthetic cannabinoids. Will it get commoditized in it? And um, can you talk about, like, you, you talk about a platform, what kind of patents do you have? Is, can everyone else kind of, you're maybe a leader in this, but can everyone else just rush in behind you in your wake? Or, or why are you still going to be strong in this sector in five or 10 years from now? Sure. No, that, that's not messy at all. Um, you know, commoditization, obviously, is something that um, any input ultimately experiences if the margins are high enough. Um, and there's no question that, um, you know, even if we're the only one doing this, there's obviously a price that the market will bear. So we can't go above that. Um, but importantly, establishing ourselves, it's not just about the ingredient, uh, Martin, it's really about the, the, the supply chain. It's about providing the safety data. Um, there's more that goes into an ingredient dossier than just the cost. Uh, and frankly, uh, like I'll give you a, for instance, the, um, you know, the, the beverage community, at least the sophisticated beverage community in Canada uh, would be very interested in paying more to receive a, you know, a 99.9% .9 pure product than an 85% pure product. And so when we talk about commoditization, it's important to understand that the, the, what we produce is not what is today uh, generally produced from the plant. It's a much higher purity ingredient. So we, we sort of separate ourselves from that commoditization discussion just by virtue of having uh, a different customer base, uh, if you will, than folks who don't really care about the, you know, that 15% contamination profile. Um, and even then, if we were to compete with them, we'd still be lower cost than what, you know, that 85% pure extract uh, ultimately is. Um, so commoditization is definitely something that we're mindful of, but it's also something that, you know, once we've, once we've got a customer captive, 
they're not going to readily switch uh, to somebody else uh, because they've gone through the qualification process with us. Um, you know, unless something comes in at a significant discount, they're not going to switch. Um, so commoditization is something that we're, you know, we're always mindful of, you know, we're always working to achieve lower costs, uh, such that if we need to pass on those cost savings to customers that we can do it without much margin compression uh, on our side. So continual technological advancement is an important part of that. And frankly, a good segue into the second part of your question. Um, you know, the IP that we generate is really almost exclusively around how we engineer the yeast cell. Um, so it's the genetic pathway that we ultimately have, uh, which is where we secure most of our IP. Um, and that's, that's unique in terms of, you know, number one, it, it provides us a moat, uh, a barrier to entry and in, in being able to, uh, you know, get those patents in place. Um, but, you know, we never rest on our laurels. Uh, we're always, uh, you know, we're always making what we've got better. Um, so, you know, we have patents today that cover the, the strains that we're using for commercial production, uh, but we're always uh, enhancing that. And I can tell you that, you know, we're filing patents on strains uh, before they even make it into the big tanks uh, because we've generated enough data at the, at the lab scale, two liter, 20 liter, uh, that we know we've got other, uh, you know, we've got things in the queue right now, which later this year are going to make it into the commercial process. Um, and so that's, that is something that we never stop doing. It's, it's, uh, it's always a, a focus uh, for us to make our technology better. Uh, like I said, we never rest on our laurels uh, and, you know, continuing to build that IP moat uh, around what we do is, is something that uh, is, it's an ongoing continuous operation uh, for us. I've got a question here, um, a couple of questions regarding a company called Amaris. This is new to me. Uh, apparently, an article was published saying that Amaris uh, had a 225,000 liter fermentation of CBG in Spain. Um, this is the first I've heard of it. Uh, are you aware of that? Can you talk about the competition? Yeah, I can talk about the competition generally. Uh, Amaris wouldn't be high on my list. Um, I think if you look at their continuous disclosure, uh, it's pretty obvious that they're being sued by investors, partners for um, malfeasance, non-performance, uh, you know, kind of blatantly lying to investors. Um, at least that's what the lawsuits all claim anyway. Um, Amaris wouldn't be high on our list of, uh, of, a, of a competitor. There are many others who, not many others, but there's at least two or three others that I think are, um, you know, going to be more competition for us. Uh, Demetrix would be, you know, sort of top on my list. They're private Bay Area company. Uh, actually, our uh, our shareholder Tuatara has a large investment in them as well. Um, they they're really good. They come out of Jay Keesling's lab, UC Berkeley, Nobel laureate. Um, the Demetrix folks are really good, and I I think very highly of uh, of the work that that they do. We we know you know we know each other. Uh, they're sort of a sister company in that way. Uh, but it's a it's a healthy competition for us, you know, to see who gets out there and and uh, and you know does a does a better job than the other. What I would say though, too, Martin, is um, you know it's not like there's going to be one cannabinoid producer out there. Um, there's going to be uh, a, a few of us. Um, but going back to the you know the earlier question, uh, I can't stress enough. This is difficult science. Um, you know, we're using. Nobel Prize winning technology like CRISPR Cas9 and it's you know its successors because CRISPR Cas9 itself has evolved beyond the initial technology uh, to do the work that we're doing and so that just by virtue of that alone the barriers to entry are high um, one needs the experience again not just say in gene editing but ultimately taking something all the way through uh, to commercialization I think those are things that are just you know they're this isn't like you can just hire a bunch of people and throw money at it. You've got to build a team that is very focused, has the experience uh, across a variety of disciplines to ultimately deliver on something. Um, you, you've talked about your platform and then you said a lot of your IP is in the, uh, in the yeast itself. If I look at it, it seems to me that there are kind of three phases to your platform. There's the yeast, there's the growing it in the big tanks, and then there's, the, I guess, the filtration. What do you do trying yep. to get it out of it? Yep. Um, what is your platform? Is it like a CRISPR kind of platform technology, or is it 
just a way of I, I, like I'm not as I, I don't have a biochemistry background like can you dumb no, it down for me no no you? yeah no it's when you think of a uh, if you uh, go back to high school biology a yeast cell has the same internal infrastructure as what a human or plant cell does so you know nucleus membranes mitochondria all those other good organelles that are associated with a cell um, and that the engineering around how that cell performs that's the platform uh, martin so fermentation is fairly well understood there are some advances that we think are going to be made and we're frankly uh planning on being part of some of those advances in fermentation uh, but really that yeast cell is what is uh, is our platform. You know, how do we engineer it? How is it unique uh, from the wild type, the original uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we use? Uh, that's really the important part of our platform. Uh, and, you know, once those cells go into the tank, there's a lot of know-how uh, at that point uh, in terms of you think of the ambient conditions, say uh, the feedstock or the nutrients that we're providing uh, to, to the cells as they propagate. Um, there's a lot of know-how there, but not a lot of patentability, uh, just because again, not, not much of fermentation is novel. Uh, it's technology that's been around for decades. Um, and same on the DSP, the downstream process where we go through our isolation and the broth, uh, that process, um, much of what we do there will be know-how, um, but it's know-how that's in conjunction with the fermentation. So it's, 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 another, it's another level of intellectual property. It's not a patent, uh, but it's something that uh, has a lot of proprietary value to us uh, in that those things aren't easily replicatable. Uh, one would have to go through, you know, one or two years of, uh, you know, of tinkering uh, with a, uh, you know, large scale fermentation process to try and arrive at what we ultimately accomplish. And it's also, it's also unique to the yeast cell that we have too. So even what works for us might not work for somebody else if their uh, if their engineered yeast cell is is quite a bit different than ours. I know this is maybe a silly analogy. It just popped in my head given COVID and everyone's baking sourdough bread at home with yeast, and every batch turns out different. I've tried baking some bread myself, and it's uh, it, every is that kind of comparable? Yeast is sort of finicky, and that if you don't really oh, yeah. contain the environment yep. and, and the ingredients and so forth, it can go haywire. Yep. It's very, it's a very delicate process, Martin. That's a, it's, it, it, it is a simple analogy, but it's not, it's not wrong. It's, it's very, very close to the truth. Um, everything from temperature to nutrients, uh, all of those things are very important for uh, not just propagation, but healthy propagation, because, you know, if you bake bread, uh, you can get the temperature right, but the sugar wrong, and you'll still get some, you know, some good rising, but you might not get the, the best outcome. Uh, and so those are all the things that, you know, when I talk about our process and the work that we do, those are the things that we're trying to optimize and really get the most out of the propagation uh, for, uh, for what we want to ultimately accomplish. Can you, uh, we're, we were an hour into this, I'm having a great time uh, learning here. Uh, can you talk about pricing at all or margins or anything on that side where, like it's still kind of early stages yeah. on this stuff with A, your costs and then the size of the market and your competition. Um, yeah. Any guidelines or goalposts to, to guide us on? Yeah, I mean, on the cost side, Martin, you know, we're obviously we don't have two years of data to, to share on the on the costs, um, you know, something substantial for you to chew on. Um, generally speaking, though, fermentation technology, um, you know, you for especially for, a, you know, a more complex ingredient like a cannabinoid, you want to try and get the cost down, you know, at least in the smaller tanks to say, you know, twenty five hundred per kilogram. Um, as you get into the larger tanks and more productivity, your costs can drop to a thousand or even much below, uh, depending on the amount of volume you're producing. Um, you know, one example of that, Martin, is um, you take the same yeast cell, drop it into a 10,000 liter tank. You know, that run might cost you 200 grand just for round numbers. If you go to a 100,000 liter tank, that might cost you $300,000. So for $100,000 Delta, you get 10 times the productivity. Uh, so those are the areas where cost of goods, it's, it's not just about the productivity of, of the yeast cell, it's the amount that we're actually producing. 
uh, where cost savings can be substantially recognized. Um, so in terms of the market size, and by the way, we're not at those numbers yet. I'm just telling you in general what uh, biosynthesis can achieve in other industries. Um, there are products today that are made using biosynthesis fermentation that are, you know, have cogs of less than $100, um, but they've been around for a while. Um, so the, the on the market side, um, what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, cannabigerol in particular as a cannabinoid has a um, as a price point that is very favorable relative to uh, some of the cogs that I just discussed. Um, and the size of the market, um, it's, it's, I would call nascent uh, today, but is expanding quite rapidly. Um, frankly, we'll be one of the drivers behind that early market development. Um, and we are seeing a lot of interest for cannabigerol. Uh, and I think when we start publishing some of the data we're going to get both on the safety and activity side about cannabigerol, I think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot more interest uh, for cannabigerol as a product or an ingredient rather for finished products. Um, so I, you know, today CBD, THC, I mean, there are obviously billions and billions in, in terms of overall size for those markets. Uh, but cannabigerol, I could see displacing uh, at least a part of the CBD market, just given some of the product formats CBG is going to be better suited for uh, from a health and wellness perspective. Um, but then also opening up new markets as well, um, you know, whether it's CBG or frankly, THC or other cannabinoids. Uh, I think, you know, the, the addressable market for us is really uh, any type of finished product. So anything beyond dried flour um, is, is really something that we can attack uh, in terms of providing ingredients to those, uh, those customers. Can you talk about currently in the market, what the pricing is for, um, for like high purity THC, CBD, or I don't, and CBG probably isn't even a big enough market at this point where there's a, a real good price like indicator. Yeah, you know, I prefer to focus on the regulated markets like Canada, um, even Europe is actually uh, has good regulations. The US is I don't even bother with because until the FDA steps in and starts regulating the market, everything that's produced down there, I wouldn't touch it. Uh, there's, we've seen a lot of interesting data around the contaminants that are coming through uh, a lot of the hemp based products in the US because again, there's no regulation uh, by the FDA. And the states don't have the sophistication level to actually monitor, um, uh, you know, ingredients and, and regulate them. Uh, in Canada, where, you know, we have a fairly, I would say, a well-developed market, at least relative to the rest of the world, um, price points on high purity THC can be between 10 and 20,000 per kilogram. Um, CBD is probably something on that same order as well. Um, it's still a market that's very uh, dynamic. I mean, there's been a lot of excess capacity and, and product put onto, onto the market. And frankly, a lot of companies are just trying to blow out whatever's in their inventory. Uh, but even in that environment, we're still seeing price points that would be extremely attractive to us uh, being able to produce uh, at, the, you know, at the costs that I was discussing earlier. All right. Uh, just circling back, you mentioned a competitor to metrics. I, I believe that's how you pronounced it. And you yep. said there were two or three other ones there. Could you uh, highlight who some of the other legitimate competitors you view as? Yeah. I mean, obviously, Kronos has the relationship with Ginkgo. Um, you know, Ginkgo is a big biotech out of uh, the Massachusetts, uh, Boston area. Uh, again, another very sophisticated company. Um, it's really tough to know where they're at. They don't provide a lot of disclosure. Um, neither Kronos nor uh, uh, Ginkgo do. Um, so, but we know they're good. Um, so there's there's definitely somebody else uh, out there like like a Ginkgo. Um, there are other companies that talk about it and you know probably have the sophistication to do it. Um, we're just not sure about their focus. Uh, you know, in terms of wanting to get into the space. Uh, you know, some of them might have viewed it opportunistically a while ago and, and then realized actually how challenging it was going to be to develop the process. Um, so there are others out there that talk about it. Um, you know, Ligos, uh, Creo is another one that I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, but again, they've, they've, not, they've been a bit of a black box in terms of what they've provided uh, to the market in terms of, you know, what their plans are, how they plan on bringing cannabinoids to market. So 
beyond that list, I mean, there's there's a host of others, but you know, it's really when you're evaluating a company, there's sort of three things. There's, do they have the money? Do they have the team? And do they have the partners uh, to ultimately bring you know this product to market? And if you're missing any one of those criteria, you're, it's never going to work. Um, there's an interesting question here. Someone asking about the shelf life of uh, the product, and I, and I, I don't want to expand that a bit more. It, it, with the shelf life, are that you're going to be integrating it with, or your your customers are going to be integrating it in drinks and creams and lotions. Yeah. What is like? Is it shelf stable? Do it, does it mix with other ingredients? Do the, it has to be refrigerated? Like, how, how is is it going to end up being a successful product because it can actually handle being on a on a gas station shelf for four months. Yeah, that's, uh, and, and there's two parts to that. There's obviously, what is the stability of our ingredient in isolation? So on its own, um, we're, we're gonna be publishing some data around that. But what I can tell you is that it's very, it's very stable, uh, you know, at, at room type, room temperature type conditions. Um, so that's, you know, that's good. Uh, with respect to how it interacts with, um, other ingredients um, that really ultimately is up to the formulator. Um, you know, we're not. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know what. Um, you know, other, you know, companies are putting into their beverages. So it's it's really on them to do that work, uh, and they're doing it today. You know, they've taken samples, and companies are doing those types of studies uh, with respect to stability. How does it interact with other ingredients? Um, what I will say is that cannabigerol. And, and cannabinoids generally all very similar properties. Um, there are a few that are slightly different, but most are most are the same when you think about, um, you know, the hydrophobicity, uh, you know, boiling points, different things like that. So a lot of the formulation work that's already been done for other cannabinoids will relate very well to cannabigerol, at least we expect it to. Um, and then having that high purity content or, or you know, quality, that's really going to be one of the bigger elements to why a product is going to have better shelf life stability. Many of the, say the terpenoids or other things that come through an extraction process from the plant, those will, those will uh, have adverse effects, not only on the other ingredients in the product, but also on the cannabinoid itself. So THC and CBD uh, both can degrade over time. Uh, uh, and having other contaminants in there uh, will facilitate that degradation. So again, just having that pure ingredient uh, really allows for, uh, for better shelf life stability, should allow for better shelf life stability uh, than what's currently being produced from the plant today. All right. Well, I, we should wrap this up here. Yeah, over sure. an hour. Um, just one final question. You've got, call it $50 million in the bank. Yep. What does that what kind of a runway does that give you? What do you need to do with that? Is there maybe any M and A involved potentially, or or what are you gonna? That's that's good change in your genes you got. Yeah, I think for us it's mostly about the product rollout. Um, and when I say product rollout, I'm talking about everything from manufacturing to the safety work that we're doing. You know, the generally regarded as safe, um, as well as bringing other cannabinoids to market. Um, you know, Martin, we burn on average, we burn about a million dollars a month on R and D, you know, salary, uh, the work with AMRI, all of that. Um, and now we're getting into manufacturing as well. Um, so we burn about a million a month. Um, uh, but having this extra balance sheet just gives us the ability to accelerate some of the other cannabinoids, gives us the ability, ability to look at, um, you know, better manufacturing, uh, processes, uh, so doing, say, some small R&D around fermentation as it relates to cannabinoid production, uh, and then ultimately being in, more in control of our own manufacturing destiny uh, as well. Um, so those are all things that really, you know, there's an acceleration component as well as a healthy balance sheet component to this, um, and we'll just find the right mix between the two uh, and uh, really just try and bring products forward and start earning revenue on those as quickly as possible. And any opportunity, or do you think there's any with uh, mergers and acquisition, could there be something you'd want to buy up or that's not really on the roadmap? Not really on the roadmap and I haven't seen anything compelling. All right, um, we should wrap it up here. Thank sure. you. Are there any final comments or I don't know if we've missed anything here, anything? Um, 
pretty exhaustively covered, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Yeah, I right. appreciate your time today. All right, we appreciate yours. Thank you very much. Have a great day, and we'll you talk to you again soon. Cheers. Take care, Martin. Bye.